Well, looking at the horizons in this particular soil profile in a little more detail, uh, it will be uh, it will, will t reinforce our ideas about the classification of the soil and some of the processes that have happened. You c can see right away that there is quite a concentration of organic matter, even including small logs and so forth. There's an example of that right there on the surface of the soil. That's pretty characteristic of forests, that the organic matter will be deposited mainly on or very close to the surface of the soil. And then we move down into the, into the mineral soil itself. And I should mention that this organic layer is called, we, uh, it, we generally call it an LFH horizon. And of course, that's sort of a, a combination of the terms L, with L being the recently added leaves, F being material that's partially decomposed, and H being material that's fairly strongly decomposed in the lower part of that layer. In this particular soil, I do notice that in this particular area, there, there are some signs that we have a bit, a quite a thin AH horizon. Um, I did uh, take a look at the soil in the woods, and actually in the woods, just over there, there is an A horizon fairly continuous, about two or three centimeters in thickness, but it, but it doesn't show up at this particular soil profile. If it was a thicker AH horizon, we, it would affect the, uh, the classification of the soil at the subgroup level. So we have <coughs> a discontinuous AH horizon that probably we, we won't really mention in the, in the, soil, prof in the soil horizons for this, this particular profile. But the very characteristic horizon uh, is this grayish colored um, AE horizon. It uh, goes from about, uh, uh, and, and normally we start our, our, our measurements at the top of the mineral soil. So even though there's some organic layer on top, an LFH on top, we're going to say that the, the, the uh, top of the mineral soil is, is zero. And so the, AH hori A, pardon me, the AE horizon goes from zero to about uh, uh, oh, 15 or 17 centimeters. So we have about uh, 15 centimeters of, of grayish AE horizon. If we look at it in a little more detail, we'll see that this AE horizon, and I have a sample of it here, uh, is one of the things we notice, and we'll come to this later, but we notice quite a pronounced orientation of the in, in, uh, horizontal sort of orientation of the structural units, what we call platy structure, but I guess we'll cover that in a little more detail later on. The next horizon is also one of those that's quite important to the classification of the soil, and that is the B horizon. And this particular B horizon is, starts about 15 to 17 centimeters, and goes down here to just about 45 centimeters. So we have approximately 30 centimeters of a BT horizon. This horizon is uh, brownish in color, as, as, as we can see, and it is quite a lot heavier texture, uh, meaning basically contains more clay than the AE horizon. So the BT horizon goes from uh, about 17 centimeters down to about uh, just over 40 centimeters. And the next horizon that we want to mention is the basically the, the sea horizon or the or the parent material. The particular uh, parent material here is a we we describe it as being a, a moderately calcareous, uh, medium textured glacial till. Uh, if we do the hydrochloric acid test, I think we'll find that the uh, the sea horizon effervesces quite strongly. It is a um, it is a carbonate-containing sea horizon. In fact, I think the upper part of the sea horizon, from here down to perhaps there, probably will qualify as a, as a, as a CCA, CCA horizon, or horizon that has gained extra carbonate. The carbonate weathered, dissolved in the upper part of the soil, moves down in the ionic form, and under these different, you might say, chemical conditions at depth in the soil, uh, precipitates again to form new or secondary carbonate in the soil. Some people call it pedogenic carbonate because it's formed by during this process of pedogenesis. And so we have <coughs> the C horizon, a CCA horizon from about uh, just over 40 centimeters down to perhaps about 60. And below that, we're going to call the horizon a CK horizon, meaning basically that it is uh, a C horizon that, that does contain calcium carbonate. We're going to consider the classification of the soil in a little more detail. Uh, we've already mentioned the fact that this soil has a well-developed and prominent AE horizon, or alluvial horizon, 
and that it has a, a brownish colored B horizon in which there's been a substantial uh, gain in clay. So the main process affecting this soil is this translocation of soil from the AE to the BT. Um, and that, uh, those particular combinations m make this soil in the luvisolic order. Um, somebody might say, well, earlier on we looked at the soils with a pronounced uh, AE and, and BT horizons, or actually BTG horizons, the, the, the luvic glycol or humic luvic glycol. Well, I often consider that the luvic glycol, in, in a sense, is sort of a cousin of a gray luvisol, and that even though it, it occurs under poorly drained conditions, the same sort of um, soil forming processes, namely the translocation of clay, is, is one of the dominant processes in the soil. So we have, the, this is a gray luvisol because it has a, um, uh, it has the grayish colored uh, AE horizon, and it has the well-developed uh, BT horizon. That makes it a gray luvisol. There are actually two great groups in the luvisolic order. If this particular soil had a well-developed uh, AH horizon that was a, over 10 centimeters thick, that was the result of um, earthworm activity, you might say, we would be thinking of this soil as a gray-brown luvisol. But if we read the classification book carefully, we notice that a gray-brown luvisol also has to be occur in a warm climatic region, we don't have a warm climatic region here, so gray-brown luvisol really is not uh, one of the uh, the other the other great group is really not one that we have to worry about. It's just the because of climatic limitations or the way the climatic specifications, uh, we won't have gray-brown luvisols in this part of Saskatchewan. In fact, they're restricted mostly to southern Ontario. So it's a gray luvisol. Uh, then, if we go to the subgroup classification. Uh, some of the things that are important uh, is, the, once again, uh, the presence of, of an AH horizon. If this particular soil had a, a, an AH horizon that was uh, 5 centimeters thick, uh, but less than 10, we would consider it to be a dark gray luvisol. A dark gray luvisol is a soil that's somewhat transitional between a, a true gray luvisol of the forest region and perhaps a more chernozemic-like soil of the grassland region. So it, it has both an AH and an AE horizon. This soil uh, has slight amounts of AH, but is, is not, it's not a dark gray luvisol. It's an orthic gray luvisol. Some of the other subgroups in the, um, in the uh, gray luvisol gray group, if this particular AE horizon was very thick and that we started to see uh, what some people, what often we, we refer to as sort of a the secondary weathering or stronger weathering in that acidic AE horizon so that we have the development of a uh, almost a, a reddish colored B within the within the AE horizon this would be the soil that we call a brunisolic gray wood uh, or pardon me a brunisolic gray luvisol and of course we'd find some of those further north in Saskatchewan but not usually in this southern part where the uh, degree of soil formation and the acidity of the soil are less so um, it, it, that, that, that is one other possible option. Uh, if this particular B horizon had a very strongly developed uh, prismatic structure, even stronger coatings on some of the ped surfaces, and perhaps a saline C horizon, uh, which would be kind of unusual in this particular topographic situation, but there are soils that have those properties, and because they have a, a this strongly developed uh, prismatic uh, B horizon, some properties of solanetic soils, there's the opportunity to call some of those soils, or there is, there is, a, there is a subgroup uh, identified as solanetic gray luvisol. Uh, and of course it wouldn't apply here because we have a, a medium textured parent material, but in many uh, situations where gray luvisols form on, on very clay materials, we see the AE horizon, we see a, there is a, a BT horizon, but many of the properties of the BT horizon are a consequence of the very heavy clay texture, and that's namely the, uh, the presence of uh, s certain structural units of a very fine sort of a, a, a granular structure, maybe some signs that soil is actually from the surface has fallen down in cracks after the soil has, has dried out and cracked. Those kind of things uh, are, g give us a possibility of, of, of using the subgroup vertic gray luvisol but certainly this is miles from being a vertic gray luvisol. This is one of the other options. In almost all situations, uh, although it's not the case here, 
uh, almost all the subgroups where we see some signs of uh, what is referred to as imperfect drainage or indications that the soil is often um, you know, somewhat wet. Uh, and that usually shows up as faint modeling in the lower part of the bee, perhaps in the upper part of the sea. Uh, we, we discussed models when we, we, when we looked at the, the Luvik Lysol, where that modeling is faint and there's some indication, usually on a, on a, where gray luvisols occur on a level lower lying area, um, of course we could then call them glade gray luvisols. In a sense, a, a glade gray luvisol is uh, this soil that's integrated between the, the, the Luvik Lysol and the, uh, and the orthic gray luvisol. It's some, a soil that's sort of halfway in between, you might say.